morning, friends. Siegfried Sassoon, 1886 to 1967. In the pink. So Davies wrote, this leaves me in the pink. Then scrawled his name, your loving sweetheart Willie, with crosses for a hug. He'd had a drink of rum and tea, and though the barn was chilly, for once his blood ran warm, he had to pay to spend. Winter was passing, soon the year would mend. He couldn't sleep that night. Stiff in the dark, he groaned and thought of Sundays at the farm, when he'd go out as a cheerful as a lark, in his best suit to wander arm in arm with brown-eyed Gwen, and whisper in her ear the simple silly things she loved to hear. And then he thought, tomorrow night we trudge up to the trenches and my boots are rotten. Five miles of stodgy clay and freezing sludge and everything but wretchedness forgotten. Tonight he's in the pink, but soon he'll die. And still the war goes on. He don't know why. A working party. Three hours ago, he blundered up the, up the trench, sliding and poising, groping with his boots. Sometimes he tripped and lurched against the walls with hands that pawed the sodden bags of chalk. He couldn't see the man who walked in front. Only he heard the drum and rattle of feet, stepping along the trench boards, often splashing wretchedly where the sludge was ankle deep. Voices would grunt, keep to your right, make way. When squeezing past the men from the front line, white faces peered, puffing a point of red. Candles and braziers glinted through the chinks and curtain flaps of dugouts. Then the gloom swallowed his sense of sight. He stooped and swore because a sagging wire had caught his neck. A flare went up. The shining whiteness spread and flickered upward, showing nimble rats. Mounds of glimmering sandbags bleached with rain. Then the slow, silver moment died in dark. The wind came posting by with chilly gusts and buffeting at corners, piping thin and dreary through the crannies. Rifle shots would split and crack and sing along the night, and shells came calmly through the drizzling air to burst with hollow bang below the hill. Three hours ago he stumbled up the trench. Now he will never walk that road again. He must be carried back, a jolting lump beyond all need of tenderness and care, a nine-stone corpse with nothing more to do. He was a young man with a meager wife and two pale children in a midland town. He showed the photograph to all his mates, and they considered him a decent chap who did his work and hadn't much to say, and always laughed at other people's jokes because he hadn't any of his own. That night, when he was busy at his job of piling bags along the parapet, he thought how slow time went, stamping his feet and blowing on his fingers, pinched with cold. He thought of getting back by half-past twelve, a tot of rum to send him warm to sleep. In drought he dug out frost, frosty with the fumes of coke and full of snoring weary men. He pushed another bag along the top, craning his body outward, then a flare gave one white glimpse of no man's land and wire. And as he dropped his head, the instant split, his startled life with lead, and all went out. Blighters. The house is crammed. Tear beyond tear they grin and cackle at the show, while prancing ranks of harlots shrill the chorus, drunk with din. We're sure the Kaiser loves the dear old tanks. I'd like to see a tank come down the stalls, lurching to ragtime tunes or home sweet home. And there be no more jokes and music halls to mock the riddled corpses round Bob Home. They. The bishop tells us, when the boys come back, they will not be the same. For they'll have fought in, just, in a just cause, they'll lead the last attack on Antichrist. Their comrade's blood was bought. New right to breed an honorable race, they have challenged death and dared him face to face. We're none of us the same, the boys reply, for George lost both his legs and Bill Stone's blind. Poor Jim shot through the lungs and liked to die, and Bert gone syphilitic. You'll not find a chap who served that hasn't found some change. And the bishop said, the ways of God are strange. <laughs> and Bert's gone syphilitic. <laughs> the one-legged man. <laughs> Propped on a stick, he viewed the August wheeled, squat orchard trees and oast. Oast with painted cowls, a homely, tangled hedge, a corn stooked field. With the sound of barking dogs and farmyard fowls and he'd come home again to find it more desirable than ever it was before. How right it seemed that he should reach the span of comfortable years allowed to man, splendid to eat and sleep and choose a wife, save with his wound, a citizen of life. He hobbled blithely through the garden gate and thought, thank God they had to amputate. Haunted. Evening was in the wood, roaring with storm. A time of drought had sucked the weedy pool and baked the channels. Birds had, got, had done with song, Thirst was a dream of fountains in the moon, or willow music blown across the water, leisurely sliding on by weir and mill. Uneasy was the man who wandered, brooding, his face a little whiter than the dusk, a drone of sultry wings flickered on his in his head, the end of sunset burning through the boughs. 
died in a smear of red, exhausted hours, cumbered, and ugly sorrows hemmed him in. He thought, somewhere there's thunder as he strove to shake off dread. He dared not look behind him, but stood, the sweat of horror on his face. He blundered down a path, trampling on thistles, in sudden race to leave the ghostly trees, and soon I'll be in open fields, he thought, and half remembered starlight in the meadows, scent of mown grass and voices of tired men fading along the field paths, home and sleep and cool swept upland spaces, whispering leaves, and far off the long, churring night jar's note. But something in the wood, trying to daunt him, led him confused in circles through the break. He was forgetting his old wretched folly, and freedom was his need. His throat was choking. Barbed brambles gripped and clawed him round his legs, and he floundered over snags and hidden stumps, mumbling, I will get out, I must get out, butting and thrusting up the baffling gloom, pausing to listen in a space twixt thorns, he peers around with boding, frantic eyes, an evil creature in the twilight looping, flapping, flapped blindly in his face, beating it off, he screeched in terror, and straight away something clambered heavily from an oak and dropped, bent double, to shamble at him, zigzag, squat, and bestial. Headlong, he charges down the wood and falls with roaring brain, agony, the snapped spark, and blots of green and purple in his eyes, and the slow fingers groping on his neck, and at his heart the strangling clasp of death. The Troops Dim, gradual thinning of the shapeless gloom, shudders to drizzling daybreak that reveals disconsolate men who stamp their sodden boots and turn dulled, sunken faces to the sky, haggard and hopeless. They who have beaten down the stale despair of night, must now renew their desolation in the truce of dawn, murdering the livid hours that grope for peace. Yet these, who cling to life with stubborn hands, can grin through storms of death and find a gap in the clawed, cruel tangles of his defense. They march from safety, and the bird-sung joy of grass-green thickets to the land where all is ruin and nothing blossoms but the sky, that hastens over them where they endure sad, smoking flat horizons, reeking woods, and founder trench lines, volleying doom for doom. O oh, my brave brown companions, when your souls flock silently away, and the eyeless dead shame the wild beast of battle on the ridge, death will stand grieving in that field of war, since your unvanquished hardihood is spent. And through some mooned Valhalla there will pass, battalions and battalions scarred from hell, the unreturning army that was youth, the legions who have suffered and are dust. Have a good day, friends.